Hello, everyone. Good to see all of you. We're going to worship Jesus tonight. And for those of you watching at home in the morning, um, yeah, excuse me. I uh, was going through Romans earlier today, and Romans 1, where it's talking about just the power of the gospel. And um, as I was thinking about just tonight and the set, I was reminded of how quickly and easily I will like substitute uh, things, things that I think I need, um, or um, you know, like if, if I if I achieve this, or if if this happens, then like I'll have you know more satisfaction or more fulfillment and. Um, just reminded again of like the power of the gospel is is what sets us free and what brings life and um, that's that's what we're celebrating tonight and so this song is called good grace and yeah it just declares the gospel so let's sing it blood is one children generations of every nation the kingdom come don't let your heart be troubled don't let your heart be troubled hold your head up I don't feel no evil Fix your eyes on this one truth. God is madly in love with you. Take courage, hold on, be strong. Remember where our help comes from. Jesus, our redemption. Light of heaven, Jesus, light of heaven, friend forever, his kingdom come. Don't let your heart be troubled, don't let your heart be troubled. Hold your head up, I don't feel no evil. Fix your eyes on this one truth. God is madly in love with you, so take courage, hold on, be strong, remember where our help comes from, yeah. His name is Jesus. Swing wide, swing wide, all you heavens. Let the praise go up as the walls come down. All creation, everything with breath, repeat the sound. All his children, clean hands, pure hearts, good grace, good God. His name is Jesus. Jesus, our redemption, our salvation is in His blood. Jesus, light of heaven, friend forever, His King. For our 
joining us at home. Glad you can join us that way. It's good to see half of your faces. <laughs> not, not like it's good to see some of you and not others. I can only see half of your faces, so it's good to see at least that half. Uh, I don't get to see you as often um, as some other people in the church, so it's good to be here with you tonight. 
Um, so we've been in the book of John. We're going to continue in the book of John, chapter 12, starting in verse 12. Uh, but by way of reminder, just to recap kind of where we've been and what's been going on with that, um, John, his purpose in writing is to prove that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And in order to, to make that known, to make that believable to people, he structures his writing in the first half of the book around seven signs or seven miracles, as well as seven I am statements, where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life. I am the resurrection and the life. And so he uses uh, signs and statements of Jesus to help people understand that Jesus truly is the Christ, the Son of God. So we're coming on the heels of the seventh sign, which if you remember is when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Uh, that was chapter 11. And obviously, if you raise somebody from the dead, it creates quite the buzz in the local community. People hear about that. It's a big deal. And so there's all kinds of uh, energy around Jesus in the community. There, people are talking about him. Some people are really excited and they believe in Jesus because of this sign. Um, but there's also those who really aren't happy with Jesus for this. They see that this miracle is somehow a threat to their social standing, to their way of life. And so they begin to plot to kill Jesus. And then as chapter 12 starts, we have a story of Jesus going to visit Mary and Lazarus and Martha again, and it's the story where Mary anoints Jesus' feet with really expensive perfume and washes his feet with her hair. Um, and again, this is a story uh, that kind of sets us up for what's about to come. And so Judas gets angry with Mary and says, we could have given that money to the poor. And John inserts a thought for us and he says, Judas just wanted the money for himself. He wasn't really concerned about the poor. But Jesus says to Judas, what she's done is good. She's prepared me, essentially, for my death and burial, a little foreshadowing for us. So people are coming to see Lazarus alive, and some people believe Jesus, and again, others want to kill him. And so that brings us to today's passage, and everybody is now going to Jerusalem for Passover. So Jesus and his disciples are heading to Jerusalem along with tens of thousands of other people heading to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. Now Jesus knows that as he travels back to Jerusalem with all the controversies surrounding him that he is most surely traveling back to Jerusalem to his own death. He knows that is coming. So today what we're going to see in our passage starting in verse 12 is a very familiar passage, the triumphal entry. Um, and then through the rest of the chapter, we will see Jesus give his last public address for his public ministry. It's kind of the bookend for his public ministry and puts him into Passion Week. And so the words that we hear from Jesus tonight are the last thing that he addresses to the general public in his ministry time uh, before he journeys through the Passion Week and then ultimately to his own death. So it's a rather long passage, uh, but let's pay attention as we work through it. Um, first of all, to see how Jesus describes who he is by his actions, how his kingdom actually functions. He's going to tell us how his kingdom will be established and how one enters into the kingdom. And so we're also going to try to pay close attention to how the people around him are responding to him. And I think what we're going to see in the passage is an invitation to become more aware of our own responses to Christ, as well as to be reminded about what Jesus is continu continually inviting us into. And so if you have your Bibles, it'll also be up here on the screen. Let's start reading in John chapter 12, starting in verse 12. And we'll just read through verse 19 right now. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it just as it is written, fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. 
The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. And so this is a familiar story to us, the triumphal entry. We preach this every year on Palm Sunday. But just some historical context for us to help us understand the gravity of what's happening. We know from the other gospels that Jesus didn't just borrow this donkey. There was a whole process of him uh, coming across this donkey. He tells his disciples, if you go into such and such a place and say this to these people, they're going to give you a donkey for me to ride. And so John just tells us he borrows a donkey and he rides it into town. And as he rides into town, people are holding palm branches. Now, palm branches had at this point become a symbol for, is for Israel, a national symbol of freedom from their oppressing rulers. And so it's linked pretty closely to the Maccabean Revolt. Since that time, it was a symbol in Israel of freedom from oppressors. So it's already a hint for you of what they think about Jesus and what he should be doing there. And then if you pay close attention to what they say, they say, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now that's Psalm 118. They're quoting Psalm 118. But notice what they add at the end. Even the king of Israel. That is not in Psalm 118. That's something that they add to it. And so this whole procession that the people in Jerusalem are going through, the palm branches, the going out to meet Jesus and walk him back into the city, this was a cultural thing in this time to welcome back a conquering king. And yet, they say, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. So what we see here is Jesus entering on a donkey. And we juxtapose this with the people's expectations of who Jesus is and what he's about to do. Who is Jesus? And Jesus, very subtly at this point, now, if you, if you were to read some commentators, they would say, Jesus isn't making a claim, a claim to kingship here because kings always rode into town on a horse. He rode into town on a donkey. But very clearly, Jesus is accepting this role as king. He's coming in, and he's riding a donkey. And what he's saying is, yes, you're right, I am the king, but I come not with might and to conquer through bloodshed, but rather I come with humility and I come with peace, and I come with love. And so Zechariah 9.9 is what John quotes there. And he says, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. And he says even his disciples didn't really understand the significance of what Jesus was doing here and what was going on until later on, until he had been glorified. So after his death and resurrection, it clicks for the disciples, and they're like, oh, that's what was going on. I, okay, I see what was happening. But if you notice, there's two different crowds here at the triumphal entry. You have the crowd of people who are there hailing King Jesus, clearly expecting him to come and defeat Rome and set up a national kingdom for the Jews. And then you have the other part of the crowd who's there because they were there when Lazarus was raised from the dead. And lots of other people, they weren't there, but they came out just to see this guy who raised someone from the dead. And so this act sets the stage for what Jesus is about to tell us in his final address. But here's what it kind of shows us, and I think we need to pay attention to this. As humans, we are prone to come to Jesus with our own agendas. We are prone to come to Jesus with our own agendas now, these people came either with a political agenda or a personal agenda. Either they want Jesus to set up their nation state for the Jews, or they came to Jesus because he heals people. So they either have a personal agenda or a political agenda. We also are prone to seek Jesus based on our own agendas. Now more than ever in our culture, we absolutely want to attach Jesus to our political views. 
Now, I'm, I'm not here to try to tell you what to think politically, nor am I here to tell you what Jesus would think about American politics in these days. I, I, I don't pretend to know. Uh, I think our political landscape is very complicated and difficult to navigate. But what I am trying to say is that throughout history, that's nothing new. People have always come to Jesus with their own ideas, their own agendas, attaching their politics to what Jesus is supposed to be and, and, and who he actually is. And it can be, be easy for us to fall into the same kind of trap, in particular in the times that we are living in. And Jesus as king is inherently a political statement, isn't it? If you say Jesus is king, you're making a political statement. That means he's the one in charge. But his approach of humble peacemaking often escapes the political landscape of our day on either side of the political debate. And so what we see here as Jesus sets the stage is that we see that Jesus is king and his kingdom has a unique agenda that's marked by humility, peace, and love rather than political and nationalistic conquest. Jesus is king and his kingdom has its own unique agenda of humility, peace, and love. So I think probably the invitation to us in this part of the passage is to maybe ask the Spirit to help us recognize how we may be bringing our own agendas to Jesus rather than perceiving what Jesus is truly up to in his own kingdom. How might we, as a people collectively, and we as individuals, be placing our own agenda on who Jesus is and what he should be up to in this world? And maybe the invitation from the Spirit here is for us to become more aware of that and to ask whether or not that truly lines up with what we're taught in scripture. And so continuing in the passage, verses 20 through 26, this is Jesus' last speech again during his public ministry. He says, now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. And so we see in the triumphal entry, if we're trying to answer the question, who is Jesus?, Jesus is king. And then this part of the passage answers the question, how does his kingdom function? What is it like to be a part of his kingdom? So it says some Greeks, and we read that not necessarily as people who are from Greece, uh, but Greeks in a generic way as in Gentiles. So non-Jewish people come to see Jesus. And here's what's interesting about that. If you remember, uh, just back in verse 19, when the Pharisees see Jesus come into town, they said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. And the very next verse says, now there were some Greeks who came to see Jesus. They were unwittingly prophesying that the world would be drawn to Jesus. And it's interesting, uh, they go and they find Philip, who has a, a Hellenized name. He's, he's actually a Jew, but Philip has a Hellenized name and probably lived closest to the area that Greeks would live. And so he was kind of there in to meet with Jesus. And they said, can we, can we meet with Jesus? Can we see him? So he goes and tell, tells Andrew, and they go and tell Jesus. We're not actually told if Jesus gives them like a personal audience. But here's what Jesus' message was to them. Notice it says... And Jesus answered them, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. The hour has come. So all throughout John, if, you, if we've been paying attention throughout the book of John, after all of his signs and his interactions, he would say like, hey, the time has not yet come. My time has not yet come. The hour has not yet arrived. And now here he's saying, it's time. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, 
I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the field and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. So Jesus uses this metaphor to explain what happens in his kingdom, what he must do to see his kingdom function. And he says, I have to die, but in my death, I will give life to many. And he says, consequently, if you're going to function as a part of the kingdom, you also must die. And in dying, you will find life in him. A life in his kingdom is a life of constant dying to self and living to Christ. Now, this is how Paul puts it in Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 11. But whatever gain I had, I count it as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. And then again in Galatians 2.20, Paul puts it this way. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, what Jesus is talking about here is that his kingdom functions in a paradox. That in all other kingdoms of the world, You do things one way, but in order to go up in the kingdom of heaven, you must first go down. In order to find life, you must first die. To gain, you must give. And this is the nature of his kingdom. This is how it functions. It functions upside down. It functions paradoxically. This is the heart of kingdom life. To die is to live, and to live is to serve. So the paradoxical nature of the kingdom is that when we let go of all things to gain Christ, we gain all that we have ever needed. And so we have been invited into union with Christ so that as we participate in his death and suffering, so we also participate in his life and glory. And as we give ourselves away for his glory and the good of others, we find ourselves most fully in him. This is how it functions. It's backwards, and it's upside down, and it's counterintuitive. And so the Greeks, they want to know what Jesus is all about. He says, you want to know what I'm about? I'm about dying for the sake of living. I'm about letting go in order to gain. I'm about spending myself for the good of others, and in so gaining everything I've ever needed. This is the nature of his kingdom. So the passage goes on in verse 27. We're going to read just through verse 33. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So Jesus uh, tells us in his triumphal entry that he is the king. He describes to us the function of his kingdom. And now, he's telling us how exactly he's going to establish his kingdom. And he starts by being honest. He says, this is going to be hard. This is going to be easy. I want to be rescued from this hour, but 
What's most important is the glory of my Father. So God be glorified in this hour and what I am about to do. And then God speaks from heaven. He audibly speaks so that everybody around can hear. And interestingly enough, people don't know what it is. They hear the voice of God and it's a strange voice. Something they don't understand. Some are like, oh, thunder, crazy thunder. No clouds, but it's a lot of thunder. And then there are some that say, oh, well, an, an angel's probably speaking to him. And Jesus says, that voice wasn't for my sake, it was for yours. And here's what he describes. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the ability to hear and discern that voice in a minute. But Jesus says that in his death, it brings judgment on the world and sin. And then it says, the ruler of this world will be cast out. And when I am lifted up, I will draw people to myself. So how is he going to do this? He's going to die. And in his death, he brings judgment on sin. He defeats the enemy. And he draws people to himself. Both justice and mercy are present here in the cross. And so while the cross is salvation to those who believe it is judgment on the sin of the world as well. But notice who he says he defeats on the cross. You have an entire crowd of people who want him to defeat the oppressors, who want him to defeat the bad guys, if you will. But he didn't come to defeat the Romans. He's king, and he came to disarm the powers. Sin and evil, our true enemy, not the Romans or the government or human authorities, but the ruler of this world. So listen to what Paul says about this. As far as the scope of Christ's victory goes, Ephesians 6.12 says this, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And then in Colossians 2, verses 13 through 15, he says this, And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven all of our trespasses, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Now listen. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. He establishes his kingdom by bringing judgment to sin, defeating our real enemy of evil powers, and drawing us to himself. This is how he's establishing his kingdom, through sacrifice and through love. And notice that Jesus' agenda and his enemy is different than what the crowd expected his enemy to be, isn't it? And how often... Is it easy for us to get caught up thinking that we are, in fact, struggling against flesh and blood? Whether it's the neighbor we've never gotten along with, the in-laws with whom we have relational struggle, the politicians we disagree with, whoever it may be, whoever the enemy is in our mind, often we ask Jesus why he's not doing anything about this, and and Jesus kind of says, I'm actually doing something about the real problem. Your struggle is not against flesh and blood. You don't, have, you don't have to worry about people. Your struggle is against the powers and the authorities, and on the cross, I disarmed them, and I put them open to public shame. He has defeated the real enemy. And so he establishes his kingdom through his death on the cross. He brings judgment on sin. He defeats the real enemy, and he draws us to himself. And so verse 34, and we'll read just through verse 36 now. So the crowd answered him, we've heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say that the son of man must be lifted up? Who is this son of man? So Jesus said to him, the light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. 
The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. So this is interesting here. Jesus has told us who he is, that he is king. He has described how his kingdom functions in an upside down, backwards way that's counterintuitive to us and yet somehow beautifully works. He has established his kingdom through his death. He has disarmed the powers. He has judged sin and he's drawing people to himself. And now people come with a theological question and Jesus answers them and and Jesus kind of has a habit of this. He answers a question that it doesn't seem they're really asking. Because what he tells us is, how is it that we actually participate in this kingdom? How do we come to be a part of this kingdom that you are describing? But notice what the people ask him. They say, we've heard from the law that this Messiah, the Son of Man, is going to be eternal but you're talking about you being lifted up. So who's actually the Messiah? Because it's not you, because we already know that the Messiah doesn't do what you're talking about. And rather than answer their question quite directly, Jesus simply calls them to faith. He doesn't offer them more proof of, hey, I am the Messiah, look at all these things I've done. They've seen all of his signs. They've heard all of his statements, and so rather than trying to prove himself, once again, He says, believe, I am the light. Walk in the light while I can be found. And if you believe in the light, you will become a son of the light. And so his answer is simple. He says, the way that you enter into the kingdom is by faith, and faith alone. Believe in me. I am the light of the world. So now, Jesus, uh, his his teaching is kind of interrupted by some thoughts from John. And this next part of the passage is, is honestly very complicated. And so we're going we're gonna to deal with it the best we can tonight. Um, so let's start reading together um, the second half of verse 36. When Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. Though he had done so many signs before him, they still did not believe in him, so that the words spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore, they could not believe. For again, Isaiah said, He, he being God, has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Now, Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory, referencing Jesus. So Isaiah the prophet says, I said these things because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke of him. Nevertheless, many, even of the authorities, believed in him. But for fear of the Pharisees, they didn't confess it, so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. For they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. Okay. This is a complicated passage. Because when we read this passage, most likely what happens is you start to ask the question of, whoa, What does it mean that God hardened their hearts and blinded their eyes so that they wouldn't believe? So Jesus just gets done calling these people to belief and saying, believe in the light while I'm here, and you will be a son of the light. If you don't believe, you'll be left in the darkness. And then he leaves them, and John tells us they didn't believe. And do you want to know why they didn't believe? It wasn't because they had a lack of proof. All of these people saw all of his great signs. They didn't believe in order to fulfill what Isaiah said, that they wouldn't believe. Because Isaiah also said that God hardened them and blinded them to the truth. And said Isaiah said this after encountering the glory of Christ. So people are going to see the glory of Christ and they will not believe. And in fact, these people in this passage have seen the glory of Christ. They have seen his power, his ability to raise people from the dead, and they did not believe. And so when we read this passage, normally we kind of kick into what I call a a chicken or the egg discussion. What came first? Was it the chicken or the egg? Did these people harden themselves and choose not to believe, and therefore God hardened them? Or is it that God hardened them and so they couldn't believe? 
And so what we feel here is a tension between the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of mankind as a responsible actor in the history of the world. And there's this really strange tension, isn't there? What do we do with this? And I'm not going to answer it for you. <laughs> but I do want to make a couple comments. Because, number one, I think that as you read all of Scripture, none of the biblical authors actually endeavor to answer that question for us. Rather, what you see is that you see through all of the biblical writings this real tension between the fact that God is sovereign over all things and yet mankind is responsible for their actions and their choices and they're held accountable to it. And somehow, these things are held in tension. And it is hard for us to understand how or why. But a couple of thoughts here, just about the idea of faith and belief. So first of all, notice that faith is not a matter of proof. Faith isn't a matter of proof, is it? So these people saw miracles. They literally walked with Jesus. They heard his teachings. They had proof, yet still they lacked faith. These people are the same as the wilderness generation who saw incredible acts of God, and even though God acted in incredible, miraculous ways right in front of their faces, their hearts were still hard towards him. Faith is not really a matter of proof. Because Jesus has actually given all of us a real body of evidence to look at. Quite literally, he raised from the dead. All of his acts, not all of them. In fact, the Bible tells us if we wrote down all of the things he did, the, all the books in the world wouldn't be able to contain it. But we have all kinds of proof that Jesus is who he says he is. So faith isn't a matter of proof. It's more than that. Second, faith seems to be a willingness to lay down our agendas and our theological assumptions and trust the way of Jesus, even when tension exists in us, about how it actually works. So again, think back just over the passage that we've read so far. You have people coming to Jesus with a political or a personal agenda. And then back up in verse 33, 34, people come with theological assumptions. And they say, no, 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 I know how you're supposed to work. I know how the Messiah thing works. If you're the Messiah, you're eternal, and you're talking about dying. So you're not the Messiah, but maybe you can tell us who the real one is. And, and like this audience, and like the wilderness generation, we have seen the proofs of who Jesus is, yet we are riddled with our own agendas and our own theological assumptions. And so we come to Jesus with personal and political agendas of all sorts. We come with theological assumptions. And one of our biggest hurdles in belief and in faith is accepting Jesus for who he really is rather than who we think he should be. Rather than who we think he should be. Now, like I said, I'm not going to answer, I'm not going to be able to answer the question of like sovereignty and man's responsibility. But I think it's important that we pay attention to how faith seems to function in these passages. Because Jesus, in the midst, he knows. Jesus knows. You've seen all of these signs and you still don't believe. You have these theological ideas. I'm here in the flesh, standing in front of you, and you still won't listen to me. And yet his invitation to this crowd is still, walk in the light. Come and believe. And so to try to help with some of this tension that we're inevitably going to fill, uh, and, and don't, I don't want to make it sound like there's no productive conversation around this topic or around this question. There is. There's volumes written on it. But the reason there's volumes written on it is because it's not easy to solve. And so listen um, to the end of this passage, verses 44 through 50. 
So John gives us this insight into what's going on in the hearts of people. They're not gonna believe. And then there's these other people who they actually do believe, but they're too afraid to be honest about it because they think the Pharisees are gonna kick them out of the synagogue. So they're more worried about man's opinion than the glory of God. And so here's what Jesus says to the hearts of these people that are riddled with their own agendas and theological assumptions. And Jesus cried out and said, whoever believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And whoever sees me, sees him who sent me. I have come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I didn't come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects Excuse me. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak, and I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. And so here's how Jesus responds to this reality. He calls them to faith. He says, believe, believe. Whoever believes in me, believes not in me, but in God, in the Father, the one who sent me, and whoever sees me, sees him. I've come into the world as a light so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. And if anyone hears my words, this is incredible. If anyone hears my words and doesn't keep them, I'm not going to judge them. I'm not going to judge them. Because he says, I know what I've been sent here to do. I've been here to speak on behalf of my Father. And what my Father has commanded me to speak to people is eternal life. So I am going to give that invitation to life over and over and over again. And anyone who believes in that Anyone who chooses to believe that I am the way, the truth, and the life will be saved. But fair warning, if you choose to not believe, then this very message will be judgment for you on that last day. So, believe. Believe. This is Jesus' response to the tension of God's sovereignty and the hardness of man's heart and the responsibility of man. It's always a call to faith, to believe. So in Jesus' last address of his public ministry, it ends with a call for people to believe and graciousness for those who struggle in their belief and a strong warning of what happens if they persist in their unbelief. And yet he tells us that the heart of the Father, the heart of the God of the universe, is eternal life for all. That is his heart. So there's a lot to get through. There's a, and I know, reading that passage, and you know, reading that passage, there's a lot more that could be said about a lot of pieces here. But for our purposes this time around, just a couple of thoughts as we close tonight. Some things to consider. First, what personal or political agendas and theological assumptions do you bring to Jesus that may be hindering your ability to see Jesus for who he is and understand the true nature of his kingdom? What personal, political, theological agendas do you naturally carry with you that may hinder you from seeing Jesus for who he is? Because like the people in this passage, we all bring those assumptions and agendas to Jesus. And now more than ever, it is really difficult to understand the interplay between faith and politics, isn't it? It's such a complicated world to live in. Trying to understand what it means to be a Christian in our current culture is difficult. And so again, rather than try to tell you what you should think politically or what Jesus thinks about politics, I ask that you would simply ask the Spirit to help you see politics through the lens of the gospel rather than seeing the gospel through the lens of politics. Let's just not get the cart before the horse. So all kinds of 
conclusions out there that, that might be different from one another, but let's at least start from the right spot. That Jesus is not something to be weaponized to prove our own political point of view, but rather Jesus is the lens through which we see politics in order to be a kingdom citizen in the midst of a broken world, a peacemaker, one who works for reconciliation, one who is humble and acts with love in an increasingly polarized society. And Jesus' call to all of us in this passage is a call to belief in him, a call to faith in his work on the cross. So whether you've never placed your faith and trust in Jesus, or you believe, but if you're honest, it's hard for you to really live that out because of the fear of how it may affect your relationships, your social standings, uh, how people may respond to you, how you might be labeled if you, in fact, are bold about your faith. Or maybe you have believed for a long time and you are truly seeking to be faithful. The call to all of us from this passage is the same. Believe, repent, trust, Salvation is found in no one else besides Jesus and the heart of the fathers that we might all receive eternal life. The gracious invitation to trust in Jesus is not just an invitation to a mental consent, but an invitation to union with Christ, to lay down our life, to find life in him. There's a call to deep trust. And we need this call over and over again not because you're going to somehow lose your salvation, but because we have a tendency to want to save ourselves. And so if we ask, how is it that the gospel is relevant to my life, this call to believe in Jesus over and over again, how is that relevant to me? I think it's actually very easy for us to see. Think about our cultural moment once again. We live in a time that is filled with fear, anxiety, power struggles, and division. And because of that, we find ourselves, people we love, people we respect, acting in ways that seem so foreign to what we would ever have expected from them before. We see ourselves acting in ways that is foreign to how we ever thought we would act. And at the root, what's at the root of all of these behaviors for us is a striving for safety and for security and for position and for status. We need control. And so as the world feels like it's spiraling out of control around us, we become rigid, we become tense, and we are grasping at air just trying to make sense of what's going on and to make sure that we're gonna be okay. And the paradoxical call of Jesus to us is that we would stop striving, that we would let go of what we are holding so tightly, that we would stop working so hard in our own strength, that we would stop trying to preserve ourselves so desperately and simply lay ourselves down, trust him. And when we do, we will find the life that we have been so desperately grasping for in the first place. Come to Jesus. Trust Jesus. He is inviting all of us today to lay down our agendas, to lay down our theological assumptions, to trust him in the midst of tension and difficulties and doubt. Jesus laid down his life and now he offers an invitation to participate in the fullness of who he is by dying to ourselves and living a life of faith in him. And so though you may know the gospel, may it be ever fresh in your hearts and minds. May you die to yourself. May the blood of Christ flow through your veins and strengthen you. And may his light guide you in times that are dark and difficult. God bless you guys. Jeremy's gonna come up.
and lead us in one more. I love you. Sing, make me to know your ways, O Lord. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. To you, God, I lift up my soul. Part of my guilt. Pardon my guilt, for it is great. Lift up my head and cleanse my shame. Be glorified in all of me. Be all I am and all I seek. Fill me with your spirit. Help me to believe, to serve. Humble my thoughts, humble my thoughts before your throne. Show me I'm preserved by grace alone. Be glorified in all of me, in all I am, and all I see. to surrender.